Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining me this evening for uh, one of the ONS uh, webinar lectures uh, for our patients. Uh, last night, uh, Dr. Gilo spoke about uh, the reasons for shoulder pain and how we manage those conditions. Tomorrow night, uh, Dr. Berliner is going to be talking about joint replacement uh, performed in an outpatient setting. And tonight, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about our young student athletes in particular, focusing on some issues that they don't normally pay a whole lot of attention to, but that can make a meaningful impact in their performance on the field and hopefully keep them injury free uh, uh, so that they can continue to participate. Uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, which will be about 25, 30 minutes, uh, I'll be happy to take some questions from uh, any of the attendees um, at the end. Uh, so feel free to uh, stick around for that. Um, one of the things I try to tell our young athletes in, in trying to get them excited about some of these topics outside the lines like diet and hydration and nutrition is uh, how our elite athletes approach these same issues. And, and when you look at athletes at the highest level, our professional athletes and our national team players, the reason they've been able to excel in their sport of choice is because they approach each and every decision they make as an athlete with habits, rituals, and routines uh, that they abide by in order to make sure that they perform at the highest level. And I want our young athletes to try to do the same in order to keep themselves healthy. So some of the key concepts that we're gonna be talking about in terms of nutrition in particular is number one, how to make sure that you take in enough calories as an athlete. Number two, making sure that your diet is balanced and that your meals are consistent. And then finally, paying attention to when you eat meals relative to training and competition. But when we look at how many calories we consume, it, it's really all about energy balance. Our athletes expend calories, even just living life normally throughout the day with digestion and metabolism. And then they're going to spend even more calories uh, during physical exertion. And we need to make sure we encourage them to replace the amount of calories that they burn. So if you look at an average high schooler who might be more sedentary, they still burn at least 2,000 to 2,200 calories. And if you look at an active athlete of the same age, they might burn as many as 3,000 calories or more. So they really have to pay attention to, to making sure that they take in enough to replace what they've spent. And then when they construct their diet, we want to make sure that their diet is balanced. Now, in my day, we used to talk about the food pyramid. That's certainly fallen by the wayside. And our current concept of a balanced diet is making sure we have enough carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Now, the vast majority of our calories will come from carbohydrates, about half. About a quarter to a third of our diet will consist of protein. And then there is about a third of our diet that should come from fat, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these. So carbohydrates are our main source of energy. We use carbohydrate to synthesize glycogen, which is our primary fuel source. Now, depending on what kind of athlete you are, this will determine how many carbohydrates you need to consume. So an endurance athlete, like a cross country runner, for example, or a member of the crew team, we'll need to consume many more carbohydrates than our high intensity athletes, including our rugby, football, and hockey players, for example. Just as a frame of reference, as we look at these guidelines, the average 180 pound high school athlete weighs 80 kilograms, and the average 100 pound you know, modified or junior high athlete will weigh about 45 kilograms. Now, protein contain amino acids, and it's these amino acids that we use to maintain our muscle mass and to build and replace muscle that has broken down over the course of competition. Now, the recommended daily allowance of protein is about one gram per kilogram per day. So for that 100 pound athlete, we need about 100 grams of protein per day. Now, again, the amount of protein we need to consume will depend on what kind of athlete we are and it's a bit of the converse of the carbohydrate equation. So our strength, strength athletes, our rugby, football, and hockey players will need more protein in general than our cross country runners and our rowers. Now, where can you get protein? So if we take a 10 gram chunk of protein, this can be found in meat, that's for sure. So a half 
of uh, chicken breast or or steak and fish. Certainly, all the all the meats have protein, but that's not the only place you can find it. You can get 10 grams of protein with two small eggs, a cup of breakfast cereal or cow's milk or yogurt, two cups of spinach or broccoli. And we know why quinoa is considered a superfood because only a half a cup of quinoa contains 10 grams of protein. So we can actually get a fair amount of protein from foods outside of, of uh, chicken, fish, and meat. And finally, there's fat. So we actually do need a fair amount of fat in our diet. About a third of our calories should come from fat. But we need to make sure that our young athletes are consuming the right kind of fat. So we want to steer clear of the unhealthy saturated fats and the trans fats. And we want to instead encourage the healthy fats, which typically come from plant oils, soft margarines, avocado, chickpeas, and the rest. Now, this, this can be a challenge to make sure that our kids eat the right kind of fat. But a general rule is trying to avoid any kind of processed food and certainly steer clear of fast food if at all possible. Again, going back to our elite athletes, now you may not agree that Messi is the greatest of all time, but I'm sure this theme is consistent among all of the soccer players and, and other professional athletes of his ilk. Uh, where does he get his, his uh, nutrition? Well, he gets his hydration from water alone, no sodas, uh, fruit juices. He gets his fats from olive oils and fresh grains and eats a fair amount of whole wheat, fruits, vegetables, seeds, and nuts. So this is what the elite athlete tends to consume, and that's why they are able to perform at the highest level and avoid injury. Now, above and beyond what we eat and how much we eat, we need to pay attention to planning our meals appropriately relative to when we participate. So pre-exercise, we want to consume a small meal about an hour or two before training. We want it to be a relatively small meal, no more than two to 500 calories. And we want it to consist primarily of easily digestible carbohydrates because we're trying to provide our body the glycogen fuel source that we will need. In turn, we want to avoid the high fat, high fiber options. This can cause stomach upset. It does very little to help us perform. And we want to be careful to eat familiar foods. Again, it's all about habits, rituals, and routines. So. You know, dogma in, in surgery is the same way every time, and we want to make sure that our athletes approach their diet in the same way. Find a familiar food that works for you as your routine pregame meal and stick with that routine, game in and game out. Now, we typically do need a halftime meal, particularly for our high exertion sports. These are typically very small snacks that are carbohydrate rich and easily digestible. So the classic for our, our young soccer players is the orange slice, and that certainly is a great way to get a bunch of sugar. It has a fair amount of hydration as well, and certainly does do the job. It probably contains not necessarily the right kind of sugar, so there's some other ways to get the carbohydrates that we need at halftime. Bananas are a great small halftime snack. Uh, whole wheat bread and, and peanut butter can actually be a reasonable halftime snack as well. There are some uh, prepackaged um, uh, fuel sources that are on the market. We tend to call these goos and chews, and, and they are a gel or a soft chew that has the carbohydrates and electrolytes that we need uh, that we might lose during exertion. They're typically used for endurance athletes, our marathoners and our triathletes, but have been adopted for our halftime uh, routine. Um, and they're very convenient. They certainly get the job done. You have to be a little bit careful because they're very dense, very concentrated. So we have to make sure we actually take a little bit of water with these and we wanna make sure that it agrees with our stomach before we make it a part of our routine. Now, after competition, we also have to be thoughtful about our meal as a young athlete. We wanna start immediately thinking towards the next training and the next game. So there are two post-participation meals. One takes place right away within 30 minutes of leaving the field and the other will take place about an hour or two later. And depending on what kind of sport our student is participating in, this will determine what kind of snack we have. So if you're a soccer player or a lacrosse player in the middle of a weekend tournament playing several matches at once, then your post-game meal should consist of a fair amount of carbohydrate so that you can replenish the glycogen that you've lost. If you're a football player and you play weekly and you're gonna have a day or two off, then your post-game meal should have a fair amount of protein to rebuild the muscle mass that is broken down during the course of participation. 
Example of your immediate post-game meal can be a sports bar, the energy, I'm sorry, the orange slices that we talked about, uh, banana with peanut butter, vegetable and hummus, all great options. And then the more substantial meal a couple hours later, cereal, milk and fruit, a sandwich with meat, lettuce and vegetables, salad and a hard boiled egg or that superfood quinoa with some vegetables are all good options. <clears throat> now, uh, families often ask, are energy bars or nutrition bars a good idea? And the answer is it really depends. It really depends on what's in the nutrition bar. So one of the themes I try to impress upon our young kids is to be very thoughtful about what you eat and drink. So when you're faced with a nutrition bar, turn it around, read the label and make sure it's doing for you what you need it to do. You want your nutrition bars to be heavy in the healthy foods that we've talked about, the seeds, nuts, dried fruits, peanut butter, and whole grains. Uh, when you look at the label, you wanna make sure it has less than 10 to 12 grams of sugar, and you want it to have at least five to 10 grams of protein. So if you look at this illustration, the left panel tend to be better choices with regard to nutrition bars, and the right panel tend to be equivalent to a snack bar or a candy bar because there tend to be a lot of sugar and not enough protein. So just be very thoughtful about the nutrition bar that you choose. And now on to hydration. So we all know the detrimental effect hydration can have on performance, but it only takes a very little amount to have an impact. If you lose only 1% of your body weight in water, this has been proven to have a detrimental effect on performance. And if you lose 3% of your body weight in water, you can actually leave yourself vulnerable to heat illness, which not only will take you off the field, but can be dangerous. The problem is that when you look at our young kids at, at uh, middle school and high school age, by the time they walk onto the field at the end of a school day, three quarters of them are already dehydrated and have already lost the battle. So we really wanna try to impress upon them the importance of staying ahead of their water loss. Well, how is fluid lost? You know, some people might not realize that you lose about 2,500 milliliters of fluid per day without ever playing a sport, just through what we call insensible fluid loss. And that includes evaporation through the skin, uh, um, uh, humidifying air as you breathe in and out, uh, and you lose a certain amount of water when you go to the bathroom. Then when you play sports on top of that, you lose even more. And there are a variety of things that can affect how much you sweat. You know, some athletes just tend to sweat more than others, regardless of the conditions. Whether it's an easy or intense training session can of course have an impact. And then environmental uh, um, factors can play a role. So what season it is, what the temperature is, humidity and altitude, all can play a role in how much fluid we lose through sweat. Well, there's some intuitive symptoms of dehydration we already know about thirst, fatigue, weakness, headache, and nausea, uh, darkening of your urine. And then you might develop some muscle cramping and lightheadedness, difficulty paying attention, and ultimately, as I've talked about, decreased performance. Um, there are a variety of ways to monitor how dehydrated our young athlete is. The color of their urine is a very easy one. We want our urine to be light yellow colored or, or lemonade colored or even clear. If it tends to be iced tea colored, then certainly that, that child is dehydrated. Um, some of our higher level athletes monitor urine specific gravity, either daily or, or at frequent intervals in order to determine how concentrated their urine is. Um, what I try to uh, encourage our young athletes to do as an experiment is to monitor their pre and post participation weight. You don't need to do this every training session, once or twice in order just to get a feel for how much water weight you lose over the course of an average competition. And that'll give that young athlete a, a sense of how much water weight they need to replace afterwards. I sort of like an understanding how much you sweat and how much you need to drink to how a young student might behave in the classroom. All of our students tend to learn over time how they learn best and how they can excel in school. Are they listeners or are they readers? Are they note takers or are they highlighters? and they gradually over time develop a system that works for them. And the same thing is true for hydration. Understanding how your body behaves during practice and during games helps an athlete understand how to hydrate in between. There are a couple of easy rules our young kids can, can keep in mind in determining how much they have to drink. So the first is the body weight rule. 
You do this by first knowing how much you weigh, divide your body weight in half, and drink about one ounce per pound throughout the day. So if our middle schooler or, or junior high schooler weighs 100 pounds, then they need to drink 50 ounces per day, which is about six cups per day. So perhaps one cup in between each class. There's also the rule of eights, which says that eight times a day, they should drink about one cup of water, eight ounces. This will depend a little bit on how much they weigh, but I think these general guidelines will at least encourage them to drink a little bit of water regularly throughout the day so that they're not dehydrated when it's time to train. Um, I try to encourage all of our athletes to make sure that they have a water bottle with them throughout the day. It stays full and they're taking sips of water again at regular intervals. And then we need to pay attention to timing relative to training and relative to competition. So before exercise, an hour or two before, an athlete should drink about two cups of water. One cup equals eight ounces. And then about 15 to 30 minutes beforehand, they should have another cup or two. During exercise, for every 15 to 20 minutes of participation, more or less, a half a cup or a cup of water. And we'll get to dilute sports drinks in a minute, but you really don't need a, a sports drink like Gatorade or Powerade unless you've been training for longer than 60 minutes. Now, after exercise, that's where that water weight lost comes into play. Because for every pound of water weight an athlete loses, they need to drink two cups. So that's where that experiment of understanding how much sweat you lose as a young athlete can help you understand how much to drink. Now, similar to the nutrition bar question, families often ask what the role of sports drinks are, Gatorade, Powerade, and the rest. And the truth is you really don't need Gatorade at all unless you've been participating for longer than an hour. And even if you do choose to drink Gatorade, you really don't need the full strength. When I work with uh, teams uh, at the national level, they dilute their Gatorade by half when they're using it during training and during matches. The role of Gatorade and similar drinks is to replace sweat nutrients and to replenish carbohydrates. So again, similar to the nutrition bars, I want our athletes to turn around the label, know what you're putting in your body and be very thoughtful and deliberate. So you wanna make sure that the sports drink you choose has no more than six to 8% carbohydrate, otherwise you're getting too much sugar and a little bit of the nutrients, the electrolytes that you aim to replace that you've lost in sweat at least a little bit of sodium. So finally, uh, a couple thoughts on supplementation. And the reason I think this is important to cover is that actually a fair amount of our kids are using supplements to some degree. Uh, a recent survey showed that at least two thirds of high schoolers are using a supplement. And the most common ones that I'll touch on are protein, creatine, and caffeine. There are a variety of reasons to use these. Our athletes use them for strength and endurance and ultimately to improve their performance. But there are high school kids that don't play any sports that use supplements as well for other reasons. So it's important that we know a little bit about this so that we can counsel our kids appropriately. And I try to divide these three into the supplement I would consider, the supplement I would be careful about, and the supplement I would avoid. It's okay to consider protein shakes. These are becoming increasingly common among our athletes, and it's a very easy way, a very effective way to get concentrated amino acids. And if you recall, the amino acids are what we use to build muscle mass. Um, if you're gonna use protein, it's helpful to use it in the most effective way, which is typically within hours of your workout. And this is a period of time that's called the anabolic window when your body can most easily make use of the amino acid to rebuild muscle. There are a variety of different protein shakes that are available, but whey protein tends to be the best one to use. It's readily available, it's easily digestible, and it has leucine, which is in particular beneficial for muscle synthesis. I try to encourage our kids again to turn the bottle of the protein powder around and look at the label. If you're gonna use protein, I think it's helpful to use a pure protein supplement. A lot of these companies tend to combine ingredients so they're going to include some creatine, perhaps, or some caffeine even, uh, and they may include a little bit more sugar in order to make it uh, more um, tasty. But in general, these ingredients are not helpful and you really just need the protein alone. And for our athletes at higher levels, you want to make sure it's a clean product with a clean label. And if you look for the National Sports Foundation Certified for Sports label, that'll make sure that our kids are staying safe. 
Now with creatine, I put this in the be careful category. I think for certain athletes, particularly our older athletes, it's reasonable to consider. Um, but what we find is that oftentimes young kids either misuse creatine or misunderstand how it's helpful. Creatine helps supply muscle with energy for short bursts and short-term anaerobic activity. So it's really helpful for a short-term, brief, high-intensity workout. It helps people in the gym get the most out of that discrete workout. It's really not meant to do better on the field or improve your performance on the team. So it has very little value for endurance and it has very little direct connection to performance. It's really all about increasing the effectiveness of your workout in the gym. And it can be effective and safe at appropriate doses for appropriate durations of time. If you use a too high a dose or for too long, it can be detrimental. It can increase water retention, cause nausea and diarrhea, muscle cramping. Um, it can have a, a, an, an impact on kidney function. So I try to encourage athletes, if they're going to consider creatine, to talk about this with their doc, their parents, their coaches, and their trainers. And then I put caffeine in the avoid category for our young athletes. Now, caffeine is ubiquitous. Obviously, many of the adults listening use it routinely each day and depend on it. It's a stimulant. Um, it blocks the activity of the neuromodulator called adenosine, and it is effective as a stimulant. It can improve performance in certain endurance activities. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's in terms of the risk benefit for young kids, it's certainly not something that they should be using. For adults, it's safe up to four to 500 milligrams per day. One cup of coffee, as a reference, has almost 100 milligrams. A gram of guarana, which is a common supplement, has about half that. Um, but again, I would discourage this for young kids. There's too many downsides to it. It can cause insomnia and restlessness at best, nausea and vomiting, a fast heartbeat or an irregular heartbeat, and even more catastrophic consequences if used improperly. So certainly at all costs, I encourage the kids to avoid energy drinks, the Red Bulls, the Monsters, and the rest. And absolutely avoid the concentrated, smaller, prepackaged doses of caffeine like five hour energy. There's just no role and it can be counterproductive. It can actually increase dehydration, which obviously we're trying to fight against. And finally, a word about sleep. I think this is the one I think that suffers at the hands of, of scheduling for our young kids. Um, it's, it's often impossible to get adequate sleep. And if you look at the guidelines by age group, uh, there's probably no way that our high schooler is going to get 10 hours with, with all of their obligations, both in school and after school. But if they at least strive to get the minimum amount of sleep required, I think it's going to benefit, benefit them greatly, not only in terms of academic performance, but also their ability to excel on the field and their ability to avoid injury and recover if an injury does occur. But as important as the you know, number of hours of sleep they they get is the quality of sleep and and this is called sleep hygiene there's a bunch of different things kids can do to improve the quality of their sleep many of which we've already talked about and again it all boils back down to habits rituals and routines we want our kids to eat consistent meals we want them to stay dehydrated throughout the day and then avoid regular napping although we can have a discussion about whether regular napping or a single dose of sleep is most helpful uh, consistency in when they wake up and when they go to bed, if at all possible. We want them to avoid physical exertion immediately before bedtime. Instead, we want them to try to incorporate an hour of relaxation before bedtime. And limiting the caffeine and other stimulants will, I think, go far to helping our kids drift off to sleep and get high quality sleep, which will benefit them greatly. So in summary, I think some takeaway points for our young kids, if this is all they remember, I think they'll be in good shape. Number one, carry a water bottle, keep it full and sip from the water bottle throughout the day. Number two, sports drinks are only helpful after at least an hour of training before that water alone is sufficient. Number three, be thoughtful about your meals, turn the label around and look at what's in there. Make sure you're getting what you need and not getting too much of what you don't need. Choose your energy bars carefully in that regard. Eliminate processed foods and fast foods entirely. Uh, eliminate the processed sugars and make sure you're only getting the sufficient carbohydrates that you need. And finally, get enough sleep again to en en enhance your performance 
and also to avoid injury. Some final advice from Ronaldo. Again, in the spirit of habits and, and routines, his takeaway point was to be disciplined, keep yourself motivated and stick to your routine. There's no room for easing off. So he himself is strict about his own routines. And, and the good thing about it is if you get into a routine and stick with it, it becomes easier, it becomes a habit. And then really it takes very little effort to, to accomplish all of these goals. Additional resources from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the College of Sports Medicine, our Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, the ADA and the NIH. And I wanna thank everybody for attending. Uh, you can visit our website, onsnd.com for, for more information. This talk will also be posted there in addition to other ed educational materials. And uh, I appreciate your attention.